Well, again, it's good to see all of you as we gather for this um, ICF Orange County session this this morning or this evening for Sherry, our, our guest today, our presenter, because she's she's uh, zooming in all the way from Israel. So I know it's it's just after 9 p.m. her time, and it's great to have you with us. Again, Sherry is a, um, a master certified coach with ICF. She's a health and medical coach and the founder of MCI, which is Medical Coaching Institute. She is a coach, supervisor, workshop facilitator, author, and international lecturer. She holds certifications in health and medical coaching, caregiver coaching, end-of-life coaching, embodiment coaching, and ADHD coaching. In addition, she is a grief educator, an NLP trainer, and the ICF Health and Wellness Community of Practice co-leader. Over the past 15 years, Sherry has worked with leading international pharmaceutical companies, medical organizations, patient associations, and hospitals. Her vision is to promote empowerment and a patient-centered medicine practice within medical systems through a coaching approach. I also want to mention personally that when, when Sherry and I spoke a few months ago to, to discuss this, <laughs> I found out that one of my mentor coaches is a dear friend of Sherry. So I just say, and he lives in Pennsylvania, she lives in Israel, I'm mm -hmm. here in California. That coaching world is 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 small in so many ways. And and Sherry and I kind of hit it off right when we when we met and we we became Facebook friends even because we just really enjoyed each other's um um companionship and company on that on that meeting several months ago and I've really been excited to and it's, I'm excited and delighted to welcome you again here to ICF Orange County and I know it's going to be a phenomenal phenomenal presentation so I turn it over to you my, my friend. Thank you thank you for those kind words and presentation oh that's uh that's every time I hear it I'm like oh wow that means it I did so did I did so much like oh okay so um a few words before we begin uh, just a little bit of contracting. We have an hour and a half together, a little, a little less. Um, and this session is going to be packed, not just with information, but with tools and skills. My agenda, I am so passionate about this really, um, that my agenda is that five minutes out of, after you come out of this session with me, you can implement everything that I taught you. So it's gonna be a lot. And to help you do that, at the end of the session, I'm going to give you the email address of, address of my assistant, which she's probably in bed right now. So it's going to take her a few hours to get back to you guys. But the idea is that we prepared a virtual goodie bag for you that's going to include a copy of the presentation, um, a link to a digital online course, a free online course uh, around how, how to, to help you support clients that you know find themselves dealing with a health or medical situation, different articles that I published. And you're going to have the option uh, or the invitation to join a Facebook group or opt into my, you know, and receive my newsletter. If you don't actively join and don't actively opt in, you'll never hear from me again. Okay, <laughs> that's a promise. Um, other than that, um, ask. No such thing as too many questions. No such thing as... Uh, Silly question? We know that in coaching, no such thing. So ask, ask, ask. If you have, have a request, if you have thoughts, share them, um, challenge me. I, um, I've i never left a question unanswered. So you can challenge me on that one. And let's make this really practical because I want this to serve you. This needs to serve you, okay? So I am going to share my screen, but before, before I share my screen, one more thing. I really believe that going into emotions, into the field of emotions is the next level for us as coaches. I think that, you know, these two years after, we you know, with COVID and now that we're post COVID, I think that has made that very, very clear. If we were a little bit ambivalent before COVID, you know, we thought, yeah, how deep do we go into emotions? And is that therapeutic? How deep we go into the narrative without coaching the story, but coaching the... Well, now we know, okay? The emotions are in the story, the, the, the stories around emotions and our client comes in with their emotions. We cannot separate that anymore. And we are also aware that there is a global mental health pandemic post COVID. So we need to deal with that. And yes, therapy is amazing and counseling is amazing. And so is coaching. 
And as long as we remain within our professional and ethical scope, we can do amazing, amazing work supporting our clients navigate their emotional terrain, create emotional agility. We're gonna talk about that today and deal with those turbulences. And I'm gonna say a few words about why the word turbulence, okay? Um, but I think we are all as a profession, <coughs> sorry, called forth right now to step up, step up and, and show up with the ability to hold a safe space for our clients. So now let's get to work. Um, okay, here we go. So why turbulence? Pre-COVID, I used to fly a lot. I mean, seriously. I mean, the, the, the guys in the in the Tel Aviv um, uh, airport used to know me already. Some of the the you know security people because I used to fly so much. Um, and for me, one of the things that re you really used to scare me were turbulences. And I realized that there is a way, first of all, you can't fight them, you can't ignore them. They come and they shake you. Everything shakes around you. And they create such a disruption that you need to learn how to ride them. Like you ride waves, okay? Like you surf the waves, you need to learn how to surf those turbulences and create that resilience and the ability in many ways to dance with the turbulence. I also, another metaphor that I wanna give you here is the idea of a new way of creating balance and grounding. When we stand on dry land and we want to be stable, there's a way that we do that physically. We're gonna talk about the body today. But imagine you're standing on a boat and the boat is rocking and imagine it's getting a little bit wavy because the wind is picking up. How do you maintain your balance? You need a different, you need to work differently with the body and you need to work differently with your, with your uh, muscles. Basically what you need to strengthen are your core muscles. So today we're talking about core muscles. How do re we remain grounded? How do we remain focused and how do we navigate or ride or surf those turbulences, those air pockets, those waves, okay? So I hope, I hope after this explanation, the metaphor of turbulence um, resonates more. But you know, when emotions show up in the coaching space and in our lives, they can be very disruptive. It can feel like a storm. Things are thrown out of balance. All of a sudden resources that were, that were, that were available Either we forget they exist or they don't feel like they're available anymore. We tend to forget things that we already know. We tend to forget past experiences that, you know, we went through something similar. It feels like a storm. And what happens is that emotions that are unpleasant, emotions that we're not used to dealing with, either with the actual emotions, because we haven't been trained or we haven't been mentored or we haven't had good role models, to deal with those emotions or to deal with certain intensity of those emotions. So for example, it's okay to be a little bit upset and a little bit pissed off, but when I'm really, really angry, that really frightens me because I don't know how to deal with that intensity. That tends to feel like inner danger. And when we feel in danger, we shift into survival mode. So when we do, do not know how to navigate through those emotional storms, emotional turbulences, we tend to go back to primal survival mode because it feels like the danger is coming from within. There's something that's flooding us. Sometimes it like, feels like a tsunami and we don't know how to deal with it, okay? So that storm shows up in our clients' lives and our clients will bring it to the coaching room. Our job as coaches is to look the storm in the eye and not be afraid and offer our clients tool to navigate through it. Cause you can't wish it away and you can't, um, you, you can't tame the storm. It is what it is. It's not good and it's not bad. And we're gonna talk about that in a bit about the concept of positive and negative emotions. You need to know how to deal with it. So a little bit of theory, we're gonna have, 
the first part of the webinar is going to be a little bit of theory, and then we're going to go into skills and tools and actual coaching. How do we do? So what are emotions? Very good question. A few answers. I want to offer three answers. They're all correct, by the way. Okay, but I want you to notice what resonates more for you. We can look at emotions through the perspective of energy and say, well, emotions are like these energies, our internal energies that move us. Okay, and we can kind of separate the E and say E stands for emotions. And it's like emotions are energy in motion. Okay. And basically, it feels like energy and some of this energy is really uh, pleasant and soft and round and some of it is, is more, um, has a different temperature maybe and feels, has a different vibration to it. But basically, we can look at emotions and say, basically, emotions are energy, different types of energies. That's one perspective. Another perspective is that emotions are biochemical reactions. Okay, so they are a result of biochemical changes in our bodies. So let's look at that. Okay, let's unpack that. And let's look at hormones. Okay, so I'm going, I'm going to give you a very general description here. We're going to talk about feel good hormones and hormones that make us feel not so good. In the feel good hormones, and these are hormones that create really feel good emotions, meaning emotions that feel really, really good. First of all, we have the dopamine, okay? The dopamine, when we have a rise in level of dopamine, we feel pleasure, okay? We feel content. The pleasure is not just physical, but it's also emotional pleasure. The ability to enjoy things, enjoy people, enjoy experiences, okay? Dopamine is also called the reward chemical, which means that usually we get a rush of dopamine after we have set a goal and we have achieved it, okay? Or we have accomplished something, okay? Then there's a rise in dopamine. The second hormone is endorphins, okay? Endorphins are also called painkillers because usually when we are in a lot of pain, Okay, then uh, after we have an increase in pain, the body will, will release endorphins. Okay, pain is also, so endorphins are also called painkiller. They decrease pain and they increase happiness and well being. When we have a high level of endorphins, okay, an extremely high level of endorphins, it can feel like a high. Okay, so I want to say something, okay, just so you know, if you are working with a client that enjoys pain and client that is in the BDSM community, okay, in the BDSM community, there's a term called subspace. Subspace is when you get a very, very high rush of endorphins, okay? It feels like being high on drugs, okay? The happiness and well-being feel like euphoria, okay? And people can get addicted to that. By the way, also people that do extreme sports that has to do with pain, not just inflicting pain on themselves, like, you know, really putting, you know, the, the body and the muscles, you know, through a stressful ordeal, okay, that hurts, the body will release a lot of endorphins. And then what happens that, you know, with people that are doing uh, extreme sports, they will have a rush of dopamine. Okay, when, when they achieve their goal and the body will release a lot of endorphins. Okay, so you see people that are chemically high. And of course, that changes their moods. We have oxytocin, okay, which we call the love hormone. So oxytocin increases emotions of love and gratitude and trust. If I, if there's a rush of oxytocin, oxytocin in an interaction with a certain person, I will be more inclined to trust that person, okay? I will be more inclined to see the beauty in that person and maybe even fall in love, okay? And we know that there are certain interactions where we can raise the level of oxytocin in our body. Last but not least, we have serotonin. So serotonin helps us decrease depression and increase euphoria. It's a mood stabilizer, okay? 
Here it's also called the mood booster, but serotonin also functions as a mood stabilizer. Basically, it's kind of a pick me up. Okay. So these are four hormones that have a direct effect on our emotions. So if we know how to tap into those hormones and how to, you know, intentionally increase the level of those hormones in our blood and our system, we can, in, you know, intentionally create a mood shift or an emotional shift. And then we have the stress hormones, okay? The hormones that create emotions that do not feel good. Here we have the adrenaline, okay? So adrenaline, usually, you know, the body needs adrenaline. The body works well with adrenaline until basically the level of adrenaline, the levels of adrenaline do not come down because adrenaline allows us the fight or flight response. So if we need to go into action, we need to move the body quickly. We need to, we need to really push our limits physically. We need adrenaline, a lot of it, okay? So adrenaline creates arousal, physical arousal, and it also creates stress. Now, stress is not a bad thing, okay? We're gonna talk, we're gonna talk a little bit about stress later, okay? So we, we need to really understand the whole mechanism around stress. And we have adrenaline's bestie, okay, which is a norepinephrine. I hope I'm pronouncing this right. Okay. Again, it, it creates emotional arousal. So adrenaline usually creates the physical arousal, but also the emotional arousal and stress. Okay. So they both create an arousal. So we, when we want to be very focused, when we need to pay attention, when we need to be vigilant, this is where we need the adrenaline. And then we have the cortisol. Okay, the cortisol is also uh, known as the stress hormone. Cortisol allows the shift between the parasympathetic mode and the sympathetic mode. So parasympathetic mode is a function mode, operation mode of our nervous system when everything is relaxed and in routine. But when there's danger, our nervous system needs to change its mode of operation and it, sh it shifts into sympathetic mode. The thing that allows that shift, and that shift is crucial for our survival, by the way, okay? Not only primal survival when a tiger was chasing us in the jungles or the savannah or the desert or whatever, but also to deal with our bank manager and to deal with deadlines at work and to deal with stressors in the family. We need to shift from parasympathetic state, a sympathetic state, and the thing that allows us to do that shift is cortisol. The moment the body in, increases the levels of cortisol in the blood, that allows that shift in, in the operation uh, mode of our nervous system, okay? However, all of these three hormones, when they increase the stress, we can feel anxiety, we can feel sadness, we can feel a lot of emotions that are not pleasant. Notice I'm not calling them negative emotions. We'll get to that. So looking at emotions from this perspective, there are two important things that we learn as coaches. Number one, our body is part of our emotional experience. So maybe it's not that smart to separate between the emotions and the body, because maybe we could use the body to work with emotions. And number two, emotions have bodily sensations. So let's play with that. So what I want you to do, guys, is I want to invite you, put down your pens, your pencils, okay, whatever you're doing. <clears throat> and I want you to connect to um, some kind of a memory that, that, that's absolutely neutral, okay? There's no significant emotion about it. Maybe it's eating breakfast today, okay? Or, I don't know, something that's, okay. And just notice your breathing and notice how you're feeling in the body. Because in a minute, I'm going to invite you to shift into another emotional state. And I'm going to invite you to bring up a memory where you were angry. Now, having said that, my invitation to you is please take full responsibility for your well-being. Okay? So. Before you shift into anger, I'm gonna stop my sharing, okay? And I wanna talk to you about an emotional scale. By the way, this is an amazing tool to use with your clients, okay? I call it the oh my God scale. And when I train in Milan, I call it the mamma mia scale, okay? 
and it goes from zero to 10, okay? Zero is like no emotion whatsoever, and 10 is like, oh my God, oh mamma mia, okay, that. So my invitation is don't go to a nine or 10, okay? We're practicing. Remain somewhere between four and five. Okay, can we agree on that? Taking full responsibility for our well-being? Yeah, yes. Okay. So back to sharing the screen. So as you're tapping into memory where you were angry, okay? Maybe, I don't know, someone didn't do the dishes or maybe, I don't know, you're angry. I want you to take the attention into the body and notice how anger, the sensation of anger, because we know what the emotion of anger is. Notice the separation, okay? Sensation is in the body and emotion is what we feel, okay? So there's an emotion of anger, okay? We're feeling anger. What are we sensing in the body, okay? Really connect to that memory. Notice your breathing. Notice it has a temperature. Notice how you're sitting. Notice if there's anything that feels uncomfortable, okay? And feel free to just drop a few words in the chat box about that. What is the embodiment of anger? Tense, thank you. Folded my arms. Thank you, Janet. Okay, guys, so let's shake that off. Seriously. Okay, Kathy, more alert, leaning forward. Thank you. And we're going to go back to that neutral memory, okay? And from there, we are going to shift into love. I invite you to connect to a memory or an experience where you loved and were loved. Notice the breathing. Notice how you're sitting. Notice, notice muscle tension. Notice body temperature. Just notice. Okay. And I invite you to share that in the chat box. So now we. Right, pleasure in solar plexus, warm, soft, floaty, ease, warmth. And Diana, thank you earlier for that in, uh, note in the chat box. Diana, heart centered, soft, open, relaxed, soft, nice, ease, warmth, glowy, tears of joy, warm and fuzzy. Wonderful. Shake it off. I know this is pleasurable. We're going to shake it off. Okay. If you need to visit that neutral experience, do that. Okay. And we're going to shift into betrayal. So again, remember, remember an experience where you felt betrayed. No need to go into the drama of it. Even if someone broke a promise or you expected something that didn't happen. Okay. Notice what comes up in the body. And I invite you to leave a few words in the chat box. So thank you, Annie and Daryl, earlier for the, for the feedback on the previous emotions. Feelings like anger, sense of collapse. Tight, chest tight, arms tight, holding breath. Notice, yeah. Okay. Notice what happens to your shoulders, feeling lost. Go, let's go for sensations, guys. Go to the body. Okay, what's happening in the body? We're playing with our inner chemistry right now. Make no mistake, because our brain doesn't know to, to differentiate between reality and imagination. This is why, you know, so simulations are so powerful. Fire, painful, tension. Okay, thank you. Thank you, everyone. Let's shake that off. Stomach tightness, weakness in the leg. Thank you, Diana. Okay. Let's shake that off and let's shift into hope. And I want you to think about something that really gives you hope. 
fills your heart with hope. Notice the body. Okay, notice what's, what's happening to the body. The breathing, the way that you sit, muscle tension, temperature. Deep breaths, arm tingling. Thank you, Kathy. Feel lighter. Thank you, Rita. Breathing is steady, smile on the face, deep breath and lightness. Wonderful, wonderful. Backbone more straight, wonderful. Now, why is this important? Because first of all, now that, thank you, Tammy, for the smiling. Now that we know that emotions, if we look at them from through the, the perspective that they're biochemical reaction, we know, first of all, that there's an embodiment to them, okay? Those biochemical changes affect the way that affect our sensations and not just our emotions, but it can mean that we can change our sensations by changing our emotions and we can change our emotions by tapping into different sensations. Okay. And by the way, this is what embodiment coaches, coaching does. It changes our state of mind through changing the body. So if you're curious about embodiment coaches, I know some really good teachers to recommend. So that was perspective number two. Let's go into perspective number three, okay? And we love neurology because we're coaches, okay? So we can look at emotions as a result of a neurological process, okay? It doesn't make the other two perspective wrong. It's just an additional perspective. Notice what resonates for you. So let's talk about that neurological process. Okay, and I'm going to walk you through this, this, this um, flow chart, okay? So we have an experience. This is the experience for now, okay? Our nervous system collects all the information about this experience, gets it to the brain, and then the brain starts making sense, okay? It needs to process the information. One of the basic ways that the, that the brain processes information is according to the quality of the information, the type of an information. So whether it's visual information, auditory information, uh, kinesthetic information, okay? But then there are other filters and ways that our, that our brain processes the information, various filters, okay? And then what we have at the end is a subjective perception. We do not have this experience in our brain. We have a perception of this experience, okay? We do not have cupcakes in our body or in our brain. We have a perception of eating cupcakes. Now, the perception is completely subjective. There's no such thing as an objective perception because the way we process the information changes. That's subjective as well. If I'm a more visual person, I will have more visual information that's going to feed into my subjective perception okay if i'm a more auditory information a person more kinesthetic information so the way my nervous system works the way my nervous system is wired is going to affect how i collect information from the experience how it's processed depending on the filters that i have there are filters of deletion there are filters of generalization there are filters of values Different filters, by the way, a lot of them are in the unconscious mind. They're unconscious filters, okay? So everything is filtered, everything is processed. We have a subjective perception, okay? Which is not reality. From that subjective perception, we have an idea of what do we think and what do we feel. So now that I have a subjective perception of eating cupcakes, then I can make up my mind. Am I for cupcakes? Am I against cupcakes? Am I going to buy stock in a cupcake factory? I don't know. Am I going to, you know, fill the fridge with cupcakes? What do I feel about cupcakes? Are they good for me? Do I like them? And after I know what I think about cupcakes and what I feel about cupcakes, then I have a behavior, okay? I can go and either buy cupcakes or, you know, protest against the whoever sells cupcakes. So if, from this perspective, if we want to deal with emotions and we want to change our emotional state, 
there's no point talking to the emotion. Okay, emotions are messy. We're going to talk about that. They make no sense. They're emotions. Okay, what we need to do is we need to change our subjective perception. Now, as coaches, we do that every time we do perspective work. We play with a subjective perception. Have you, and you've probably noticed, you probably have, you know, have a memory of a client that the moment they shifted perspectives from one perspective to another, their emotional state changed completely. What did we do? We changed the subjective perception about the event or the topic. As simple as that. So you, you guys already know how to do this. So it can be cupcakes, but guys, it can also be anything else. The event itself, the experience can be any experience. So emotions are an inseparable, inseparable part of our lives and they're gonna show up in the coaching space. So we better be prepared. A few things are important at this point that we know and understand. I'm gonna pause and ask if you guys have some questions, okay? First of all, emotions make things messy. They do. Okay, we had an agenda for this session and the, and the client comes up, comes into the session and they're in an emotional state and everything needs to wait and we need to deal with that. There's no way around emotions. We can't ask them to wait outside the room until the coaching is done and then invite the client to collect their emotions on their way out, okay? We need to work our way through them. And different people express emotions in different ways. We're gonna talk about that because guys, that seriously triggers our bias. And we need to be aware that we have bias around emotions. Okay, before I go into some theories about emotions, um, let me just stop for a second and see if there are any... Um... Okay, Nomi, Nomi has a question. How do you view male and female stress? We are now becoming more aware that these, that these processes are in fact different. I think that the biological and chemical process of stress is the same. I think that it's how we deal with stress that's different, how we express stress. And that has to do with our upbringing. It has to do with culture. It has to do with beliefs. It has to do with religion. It has to do with very, very early imprinting. So I think, you know how, for example, okay, let me, let, let's, let's talk about emotions, going back for emotions right now. You know how, um, we can have the same emotion like anger, and then we have a man express anger and a woman express anger, okay? We look at the man and go like, hmm, okay. Maybe that's kind of sexy, but it's definitely very assertive. It's kind of masculine. We look at the woman and, oh my God, she's a bitch, okay? Take sadness, okay? Profound sadness. Two people are profoundly sad and they're crying. A woman crying and a man crying. We will have so much empathy for the woman. Okay, we're gonna look at the man, we're gonna have less empathy for the man. I'm not gonna go, you know, and I'm, and I'm being very gentle here, okay? Because actually, most men that show vulnerability and sadness in public, it's not that they don't get empathy, they actually get judgment and they can be serious consequences. So I think it's not the stress process. I think biologically and neurologically, it's the same. I think it's, it's the way men and women deal with stress. Okay. And we can also, you know, depending on the time we have left, I might revisit that and talk about men and women, the capacity of caregivers, talk a little bit about millennials. I'll see if I have enough time to touch that. Okay. Especially if, you know, if you look, you look you're looking in, in a corporate context about female and male employees dealing with stress. Okay. It's the strategies that are different not the actual uh, process. Any additional questions before we continue? Let's continue. Okay. Uh, okay, yeah, sure, let's continue. Okay, so a few theories about emotions. I'm gonna keep this very short, okay? Because I think that it's nice to have, but it does very little, to be honest with you. And the most common re uh, theories that you're gonna come across our theories around basic emotions. What does that mean? That we have like we have basic colors and then all the rest are different, you know, um, mixtures and shades. 
Same with emotions. So there are a lot of theories about the concept of basic emotions. We have a few basic emotions, and then all the rest of the emotions are different shades and you know integrations between these basic emotions. The problem is, okay, that this is just you know a few theories, okay. Now, if you look at the at the left column, you'll see the name of the theories, and if you look at the right column, you'll see the number of basic emotions. It goes from two to I think eleven or twelve. So all of those researchers and theorists, you know, somehow don't seem to come to an agreement about how many basic emotions do we have and what are they? Okay, what do we do with that? I don't think there's anything to do with it, but but you know what? It's good to know, and I'll tell you why it's good to know because that's going to lead us to the concept of an emotional vocabulary that I'm going to discuss with you when we talk about the doing, about the coaching skills. So here's another really famous one by Robert Plutchnik. Plutchik. Um, and and it's, it's nice to know, nice to have. However, let's take a step back, okay? We talked about male, female. We talked about bias. We have bias. We all have bias when it comes to emotions. And we need to understand that we judge people according to their emotional responses, we assess them, we evaluate them, and there's certain standards that we use in order to, to look at the emotional response of someone. First of all, we look at intensity. So we can look at someone that's weeping and then someone that's crying hysterically, okay? And we're gonna pass judgment because maybe we feel more comfortable with someone that's weeping silently rather than someone that's crying and everybody's hearing them. And that has to do with culture and upbringing, which brings me to number two, okay? Emotional expressions have a cultural context to them. I live in the Middle East. Everything is out in the open. We are loud people. We talk with our hands. We're very, yeah. my colleagues in the UK call it animated. They always say, sure, you're very animated. Yes, because I speak with my hands and I'm loud. Okay, I'm all over the place sometimes. But this is the culture. This is the Middle East. Okay, so when we're angry, we are really angry and you're going to know. When we're sad, we are very sad. We have no problem crying in public. And when we're happy or we love, oh my God, there's no personal distance. That goes out the window, okay, because we're touchy feet, we're all over each other. That's the culture. Um, and I remember that when I was, uh, a few years ago, I was traveling back to Israel and I was in one of the European, um, European airports. I think it was. I don't remember. I think it was Germany. And there were these two guys that, you know, they were from some Middle Eastern country. I can also see according to the gate, but also the way that they looked and the way they were dressed. They were like, oh, these are from my neighborhood. Um, and they, they were traveling back. I think it was back to Lebanon. I'm not sure, but they were traveling back for a funeral. I think it was their mother's funeral. They were lying on the floor crying. Now, around them, was an entourage of their people. And they were just holding a safe space while these two adult men, I kid you not, were on the floor of the airport crying out loud. You could not miss it even if you wanted. Now I went by that and I'm like, okay. But I could see the reaction because I was traveling with some people. I could see the reaction of, of my Irish colleagues and my English colleagues and my French colleagues. They were shocked. Okay, this, this has to do with culture. So, <clears throat> you know, we do a lot of uh, diversity and inclusion trainings. Let's add emotions into that, okay? There's an emotional context. There's a gender context. You know, we mentioned that a few minutes ago. Things that we, um, we can, emotional responses we can accept from women, emotional responses we can accept from men, emotional responses we cannot accept from women. And responses we cannot accept from men. We judge according to age. There are certain things that we are willing to tolerate from a child that we will not tolerate from an adult. Okay, we are okay with a child skipping and singing and being very, very happy. But if we see an adult, like a colleague in the office, skipping and singing, singing because they're very happy, mm, not so much. Okay. We're, we are tolerant to a guy throwing a tantrum. We're not so tolerant to an adult throwing a tantrum. 
and context. Guys, context is everything. There are certain emotional reactions we are willing to tolerate in one context. We will be very judgmental if that same emotional expression would show up in a different context. We're going to talk about that in a bit. So emotions make everything messier. So here are six ways in which emotions make things messy. First of all, it's easy to confuse emotions and sensations. You saw that in the exercise that we did, okay? When we don't have an emotional vocabulary and we don't have words to describe what we feel, we go to the body. So you can ask a client, how are you feeling? They go like, oh, I'm feeling a little down. Down is a sensation, not an emotion, okay? We confuse our emotions and our thoughts. How are you feeling? I think, um, you know, I'm a little bit worried. That's a thought. Worry is a thought, not an emotion, okay? We have strategies around emotions. We fake emotions to get what we want. By the way, that's a smart strategy, okay? We tend to call it manipulative. For guys, if it works, it works, okay? We tend to cover emotions with other emotions. The classic example to that is anger that usually covers sadness because sadness is perceived as weak and vulnerable. We feel vulnerable when we're sad. However, anger gives us the illusion of being proactive and, you know, and, and being more powerful and in control. Of course, it's just an illusion, okay? By the way, whenever you come across someone with anger, you will see, you know, once you create rapport and trust with that person, underneath the anger, there's usually gonna be sadness and hurt. <clears throat> Sorry, sometimes our own emotions are unclear to us. And emotions can cause us stress, and stress intensify our emotions. So there's a vicious cycle there. Okay. We can't talk about emotions without talking about resilience. Because, because we need to, because the two go together. So here's the thing. I was looking uh, for images around resilience today, and I came across two images that you know that really show up a lot. Um, they also show up in metaphors when I speak with clients or I do workshops around resilience, and I say, ask people, so what is resilience for you? It's usually something along these lines: you know, standing strong in the face of adversity. You know, I'm going to be a mountain. I'm going to be an oak tree. I'm going to. This is not realistic. This is not resilience. And this is not sustainable. And if, if we um, mistake resilience for the ability, okay, to uh, fight off a wrecking ball, then we're setting, us, we're setting ourselves up for failure, okay? So I know there are a lot of definitions of resilience. I wanna take you to the definition that medical coaches work with. We work with the definition of the American Psychological Association for Resilience, okay? And I'm actually, going to go to the last uh, line here. Resilience is the ability to bounce back, okay? Not fight off, not resist, okay? Not endure, but bounce back from difficult experiences. So let's work with the bouncing thing, okay? And let's work with the metaphor of a ball that bounces. So there are three things that will usually affect the bounciness of a ball, the ability of a ball to bounce back. One is going to be the rigidity of the surface. Okay, it's going to affect how and if the ball actually bounces back. The size, shape, and material of the ball and the elasticity. So now let's translate that into coaching language. The rigidity of the surface is our perception of the adversity and that we can change, okay? The size, shape, and material are skills, resources, and actions. We know how to coach clients around that. And elasticity is our emotional agility. So let's talk about emotional agility, okay? Emotional agility is an inseparable part of resilience. And this is why resilience, when we talk about emotions, we need to talk about resilience and we need to talk about emotional agility. So what is emotional agility? First of all, it's an ability. Okay, it's an ability and a skill, by the way. It's the ability to be aware of what we're feeling right now. In order to be aware of what we're feeling, we also need to be able to give it a name, okay? Because we can't deal with things that do not have a name. So we need to be aware of what we're feeling. What is the emotion right now? 
be able to gain some reflective learnings. What am I learning about the situation myself and the emotion? And from that, make a choice to create an emotional shift, okay? And it's also a skill. Emotional agility can be taught. We can coach people to be better, to be more emotionally agile, okay? To the degree that it becomes second nature, it becomes an authentic way to navigate their emotional reality. Does that make sense, everyone? Great. So now we're gonna go into the coaching, okay? So here come all the skills and tools. So I'm just gonna check the chat box. Okay, there's a link here that I'm at Naomi. Okay, um, Naomi, I'm gonna check that afterwards if that's okay, but thank you. Thank you for the link. Okay, any other questions? Okay, so let's go into the coaching. Shuri, I, yes. I have a question. Um, yes. Are you going to discuss at all, you know, the biochemical reactions part where you were saying if you can, um, like, uh, you know, how to utilize those so that you can get out of certain emotional states? Yes, I'm going to do that now. Perfect. So I'm going to, I'm going to start giving you a lot of tools that you can use. Okay. And... <clears throat> I'm gonna tell you what that does, okay? And a lot of these are gonna be working with the body because when we have a client that's emotionally distressed, tapping into resources through the mind, you know, that's, that, that's gonna take a lot of time. We wanna hit the ground running to create a very fast shift. And the best way to do that is working through the body, okay? And when you know how the body chemistry works, then it makes sense to you. Then what I'm gonna say now, from now on, is gonna make sense to you guys, okay? Great. So four principles, okay, before we go into actual tools. First of all, the client and only the client names the emotion and defines its quality and intensity, okay? Even if the expression looks very familiar, okay? And you go like, oh my God, I react the same when X, Y, Z happens. Don't make an assumption that you know the name of the emotion and you know how it feels for the client. You know how something similar feels for you, okay? So as coaches, we don't make assumptions. We ask the client, client, how are you feeling? What is the name of the emotion right now? Context is everything. Emotions exist in a context. They do not exist outside of a context, okay? And identifying the context and changing the context allows us to help the client create a change in the emotional experience. Third principle, every emotional experience holds a positive learning. We can learn from every emotional experience. It's not just a learning, it's a positive learning. The concept of a positive learning means that this is something positive I'm learning about myself. Not about the world, not about other people, about me. Something good that I'm learning about who I am. That is what a positive learning is. And it's different from a general learning. And we always wanna be aware of bias, our bias and our client's bias. Because once we, we start inviting our clients and we hold a safe space for those emotions, their own bias will come out, okay? So the first tool that I wanna give to you, okay, is a process of shifting from crash state to coach state. So within this process, we're going to have, this is a great acronym, okay? Remember, you're, you're going to get the slides from me and you're going to get the recording from, from the chapter. So this is really going to help you. Here's how we create, we're creating a shift. CRASH is an acronym for this state of emotional distress. The C stands for contraction, okay? Then these are things that we want to notice. The, con the contraction is physical, emotional and cognitive. You felt that when we were playing with emotions. So there is a contraction of the breathing, the breathing becomes very shallow. 
okay? There's a contraction of the body. Sometimes, you know, uh, uh, the way we, our body language changes, okay? We tend to hold our, our hands and, 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 and legs closer to us. Okay, cross our legs, we cross our hands. There's also contraction when it comes to emotional contraction, okay? Sometimes in a crash state, people go numb, okay? They don't feel right now. There's no emotional expression. And the mental, okay? We get that tunnel vision. I need to, it's either or, okay? All of a sudden, my ability to explore perspectives just vanishes, okay? My, my 180 view, okay, narrows to a tunnel view. The R stands for reaction. In crash states, we tend to be reactive rather than proactive. A stands for analysis paralysis, meaning our ability to go to a meta view and analyze what's going on, see patterns, is completely paralyzed. We only see things from first position. Now, if you have a bit of an NLP background, then first position is me, second position is empathy when I step into someone else's shoes to see the situation from their perspective. Third position is the meta view that we use in coaches when I, when I look at things from above, okay? Fourth position is the perspective of the group, it's the we, okay? And fifth position is the perspective of the system, okay? All of those are paralyzed. I can only experience me right now and what, what I'm seeing through my eyes. The, the, uh, the additional thing is that the analysis paralysis also prevents me from tapping into my values and my belief system and my inner resources. The S stands for separation. The separation creates an experience of isolation. So I feel separated. Many times when we are in distress and we can be, and we're in a room full of people, we feel completely unknown because nobody's seeing us right now. Nobody, nobody has any idea that I'm in distress, that I'm, happy, that I'm experiencing anxiety. You see that, you hear that a lot from people that are going through an anxiety attack. They feel total separation, okay? I am going through hell right now and nobody sees this, meaning I'm all alone, I'm isolated. I'm actually isolated, I'm alone in the world. And the H stands for hurt and hate, okay? There's an experience of, sorry, hurt, uh, yeah, hurt and hate. There's an experience of emotional hurt, okay? And for some people that remember how anger covers sadness, Okay, so when it's difficult to hold the space for the hurt, that's going to shift into hate. Okay, it's going to come out as this is because someone else and I hate that person or I hate the situation or, okay, this is the crash state. When we want to create a shift, we want to create a shift into a coach state. And here's an acronym that's going to help you because coach is also an acronym. So first of all, we want to shift into, we want to help the client center themselves okay so let's talk a little bit about centering and i want to teach you a very easy technique there's a lot of information about centering online but what centering does is it brings all the attention to the body by doing that we bring the levels of cortisol down which means we're going to bring we bring yeah sorry we bring the levels of cortisol down which means the stress goes down the moment the cortisol goes down, there's room for endorphins. So we're playing with the body chemistry when we're centering, okay? So let's do this together. Very simple way, ABC of centering, okay? By, by the way, this is by Mark Walsh, an amazing embodiment coach from the UK. So he has a lot of really, really good free stuff online. So you can search him, Mark Walsh. Um, so... Now you notice we're using the body. So A stands for awareness to the body and the breathing. So let's do that with me right now. What I want you to do is first of all, become aware, okay? That you're sitting on a chair right now. Notice how you're sitting, okay? If you're slumping a little bit, then, you know, kind of organize the way you're sitting that you, so that you're sitting up straight and then noticing how you're breathing. Now, the reason I want you to notice your breathing is because we're gonna change your breathing. We're gonna shift from upper shallow breathing, which is, which is what usually shows up when there's high levels of cortisol in the body, the body's in stress. We tend to breathe up here, shallow breathing. In order to create a shift and reduce the levels of cortisol, we need to change the way that we breathe. So what we do is we shift to abdominal breathing, okay? So imagine 
Take one hand, put it up here. Take the second hand and put it underneath your navel, your belly button. And now as you're breathing in, and I want you to in inhale through your nose unless, unless you know, you're having a cold and that's difficult. Okay, and I'm gonna explain everything in a second. Inhale, and as you're inhaling, send the air down to the hand that's below your belly button, your navel, as if you have a small balloon there. This, if this doesn't move, it's okay. Notice that your lower abdomen is moving as you inhale and exhale. If you can do both through the nose, that's excellent. If you're struggling because you have a cold or something, then breathe through your mouth, that's fine. Now, let's talk about the physiology of this. First of all, when we're breathing through our nose, we, can't, we cannot hyperventilate. We can only hyperventilate when we're breathing through our mouths. So the moment we close our mouth and we're breathing through our noses, we're regulating our breathing and we're regulating our blood pressure. We are lowering our heart rate, okay? The other thing is that when we do the abdominal breathing, we are filling the lower part of the lungs, meaning we are increasing lung capacity. More air goes into the lungs, which means more oxygen goes into the blood. More oxygen goes into the blood, more oxygen goes into the brain, and we're changing the brain capacity, okay? Another thing is that when we breathe the lower abdomen breathing, we are working with the diaphragm. Now, because we live in such a stressful environment and we sit most of the day, we tend to breathe up here. So for many of us, our diaphragm muscles weaken, okay? And that invites a whole set of health issues, okay? Because uh, when we breathe and we move our diaphragm, it massages our internal organs, especially our digestive system, okay? So by the way, if you're constipated, use abdominal breathing, okay? It's gonna massage your in internal pistons and that's probably gonna resolve the issue. So A, awareness of the body and the breathing, okay? B, we get balanced by connecting to where we are right now. So look around you, notice where you are, okay? What I want you to do is either look at your desk and if you have a window, look outside the window and count the things that you see. It can be pens on your desk, it can be trees or people outside the window, it can be pictures on the wall. Our brain cannot do things, two things at once, okay? That's a myth, by the way. Our brain works in a linear way. Multitasking is a myth. And it's very unhealthy, by the way, okay? So the moment we start counting something, we use our thick senses, okay? We stimulate one of our senses and doing that, which are very, with our eyes, with our visual senses, the easiest. Our brain needs to let go of all the inner chatter and focus on the task at hand, which is counting something, okay? So by the way, if you're working with a client that's in a loop of thoughts, start working visually with them because the brain's gonna have to let go of that loop of thoughts and deal with the task ahead, okay? So when we start looking around us, all of a sudden, the emotions we have to where we are come up. So if we are at home, okay, then usually we're gonna feel comfortable. And we have a context of being in an environment where we chose to be that's comfortable for us right now and serves us at the moment. And C stands for center of gravity. So center of gravity is basically making sure that we align the body. So. When we're standing, it's going to be warrior posture. So if you if you have any experience with martial arts, basically means that you have you spread your your legs, you know, at the width of your shoulders. Okay, you bend your knees a little bit and you tuck in your tailbone. But we're not standing right now, so let's do that sitting. Okay. So what I want you to do is I want you to move a little bit to the edge of the chair. Have two feet on the ground. Okay, and imagine that you're an upside down pendulum, okay? Meaning this is the string and this is the actual pendulum, the head. And what I want you to do right now is just allow your head to swing a little bit, back and forth, ever so gently, left and right. Okay, a little bit in a circle. I want you to find the place where your head is exactly above your pelvic area, providing your back is straight. So if you're stopping, sit up, okay? 
our center of gravity is always in our pelvic area. The moment our head is right above our pelvic area, we are physically centered. By the way, when we're standing like that, it's very difficult to push us over, physically speaking. Okay, this is why it's called a warrior position, by the way. Okay, when we are aligned like that, something changes in our, in our inner chemistry. So this is the centering. And there, there's a lot of material online that you can use about centering. So let's go back to the coach state. The O stands for open, okay? So open, we can work on open on whatever level resonates with our clients. We can start by opening our hands, okay? Working through the body, okay? Because open is on a physical level. And as we do a motion like this, our chest open up, opens up and our breathing changes. Again, more oxygen to the brain. I usually start physically because then from a posture like this, it's easy to invite the client to open their heart. Okay? Because that motion is aligned with the body language. And after we open our heart, we open our mind. One way to do that is actually to close our eyes Imagine that our vision area opens up 180 and then 360. And we become aware of everything that's around us and then open our eyes again. Okay? So we become open. And as we practice this openness, we ask what becomes possible. From this openness, we're also going to tap into the awareness. What are you becoming aware of? What are the resources and the possibilities you are aware of outside of yourself and inside? That's possible only after we open up, okay? And I say open up physically, emotionally, mentally. And if you have a client that has, has a lot of spiritual resources, then you can also open up spiritually. So then you wanna open up the connection to the higher self or the universe or God, whatever that means for the client. You do that through the top of the head, okay? If you work with chakras, then you do that through the crown chakra. If not, just, just open up here. Pe that resonates with people. Your client will know what to do with that. If your client has, you know, is, is, has a spiritual practice, they will know how to open up spiritually and reconnect. Okay? So the openness, the awareness, and then we name the connection. So what are you connected to? Okay? Remember that we started with the centering. The centering creates that initial connection to the body. So we're connected right here to the here and now. Remember everything we did in, in, the, in the centering, okay? Connected to the body, we connected to where we are, we connected to the breathing. Now we start naming the connections. What are you connecting to? Okay, what are we doing? We are changing, we're shifting out of isolation, out of separation, okay? And then we go into holding space. And I wanna teach you something when it comes to holding space because holding space can be a very general thing. And it's good that we hold a safe space for our clients. However, we want to teach clients to hold a safe space for themselves, okay? And this comes from embodiment coaching from a technique called Uzazu, which was developed by an amazing embodiment coach called Dylan Newcomb. He's Canadian and he's amazing. So you can check him out, okay? And what I want you guys to do with me, I'm gonna just tilt my camera, okay? When we hold, think about the, you know, when you hold something, Hold something dear to you. Where do your hands go? We're holding something precious. It goes like this. Yeah. It also goes like this. When you hold a baby, when you hold a, a little animal, a puppy, okay? We cradle, okay? This is a safe holding, cradling. So one of the ways that I teach clients to hold a safe space for them is to cradle themselves. So what we do is we open the cradle, Okay, and we create a safe space here. This is a safe space that you're holding. And what you're gonna do is you're gonna put yourself inside. Okay, so I'm gonna be holding a safe space and I'm gonna be cheery here. And some clients shift into this and they're, and they're cradling themselves and some clients are gonna shift into this. Okay, and then we're gonna have a coaching conversation on what is the doing of this when you need a safe space for yourself. 
okay? How do you create that? So we have this posture, okay? But then we can also create strategies around it. But this creates an immediate, an immediate shift because this is very clear. This is me holding myself, which means I don't depend on you, coach. I don't depend on anything else. I can do this anytime, anywhere. I can hold me. And if I can hold me, then I'm safe. Does that make sense? So this is the whole strategy, okay? Shifting from crash into coach state. Now let's go into additional tools and skills. So we talked about centering, okay? And I wanna talk about creating a safe space for emotions, okay? I want you to notice what can make emotions unsafe for a client in a coaching space, things you need to pay attention to. You need to pay attention to yourselves. Remember, this is a trusting relationship. However, there are a lot of clients that really want to be really good, really, really good clients. They want to be excellent clients and they want us to like them. Notice, okay, if your body language, if your reactions, if your unconscious bias is showing up, that might make this an unsafe space, even though that's, that's the opposite of what you want. The culture. Okay, the client brings their culture into the safe space. So they're gonna bring all the cultural conditioning. Okay, so you wanna be aware of that. You might wanna name it. You might wanna mirror it for the client. Beliefs, we have an entire belief system about what it means to uh, express emotions safely, the appropriate way, the inappropriate way. So we wanna be curious about beliefs because beliefs the client's beliefs around emotions can make this an unsafe space. Personal experience. Okay, if our client had a coaching experience, a therapy experience, doesn't matter. I had an experience with another human being when they became emotionally vulnerable and they were, were not held in a safe way. The, the, the space wasn't safe. They were betrayed. It doesn't matter. Okay. They will have an issue with trust. They will bring that experience, those, those scars. So we need to acknowledge it, respect it, okay? Social conditioning that has to do with gender roles and different things, okay? Social conditioning can make emotions unsafe and self-esteem, okay? So just notice, you can be amazing, but then these things are also present in the space. We want to help clients create an emotional vocabulary, okay? Because it's different, difficult to talk about something that doesn't have a name. So to this end, you probably know the emotion wheels, okay? They're pretty similar, okay? One is the two most important ones is one by, it's the feelings wheel by Gloria Wil Wilcox and uh, the emotion feeling wheel by the Junto in Institute, okay? You can work with them. But you know what? You can also allow the client to name it. So this emotion, okay? And this is something if you're an Eckhart Tolle fan, okay? Eckhart Tolle actually wrote about that, okay? Eckhart Tolle has a process where basically this is a, there's an emotion and we start and we, we give an emotion a name. And if an emotion doesn't have a name, let's say that I am worried about my finances, and I don't know exactly what it is. Is it anxiety? Is it fear? Is it just worried? Is it, we call it by the name we can give it. And we say, okay, so this is how worrying about my financial situation feels like. What do I need right now? I can do this. I can do the emotion of worrying about my financial situation. Now, how do I want to do it differently? Now, give the client permission to give it any name, even if it's a metaphoric name. This is really important um, when, when we're working you know, with clients that are dealing with a lot of emotions, especially clients that are going through burnout, okay? And this concept actually comes from pain management, the concept of naming the emotion. The same way when I work with clients, with endometriosis, with fibromyalgia, 
we create a pain vocabulary. And the same way, you know, they say that, that Inuits have, you know, 50 names for snow. I don't know if that's true or a myth, okay? But you would be amazed. The ones we create awareness around pain or around an emotion, different emotions will have different names and there might be a few or like, you know, 10 or 15 types of sadness or anger or happiness or joy or hope or love. I invite you to check this out. These are really two, two cool videos on YouTube. So you're gonna get the, the slides so you can you know, check out YouTube's, but, but this is really nice because sometimes you might come across an emotion that doesn't have a name. So it's very empowering to invite the client to actually name the emotion. It can be pink rose, whatever. Okay, let's talk about context. Context is everything, okay? So level one, I'm gonna do an exercise with you, okay? Because when we reframe the context, we expand the emotional vocabulary. So I invite you to pay attention to the screen because here we have a protagonist, a client with an emotion. How do we know there's an emotion? Because there's a tear. Usually that's an associated with an emotion. Notice that I don't know what kind of an emotion this is. Okay, I know there's a tear. I'm going to have to ask this client what the emotion is. But this emotion has a context because emotions exists with, exist within a context. So I'm gonna play with your bias right now, guys, okay? Notice what you're feeling because this is the context and I'm gonna be changing contexts. This is why there's a tear and she's feeling what she's feeling. This is the context. And now this is the context. And now this is the context. Notice if, if you, how you feel about her emotion, about her changed. And now this is the context. And now this is the context. Something changed in you. Now I'm gonna do the same thing. I'm just gonna change the client. Now this is the client. And this is the context of his emotion. And now this is the context. And now this is the context. And now this is the context. And this is the context. Okay. So this is a really, really good exercise, first of all, in kind of um, discovering our own bias, but also in the power of context. And I wanna offer you a really good reframe that helps a lot of clients. Now I work with clients that by definition are overwhelmed, they're extremely distressed, okay? When I have a client that's having an emotional reaction, the, the reframe that I offer is that this is a normal reaction to an abnormal situation. Something about the situation is abnormal for the client, not necessarily for me. Re remember that subjective perception. Something about this is abnormal and that created the emotion. So this is a normal reaction to an abnormal situation. And what I did is two things. I immediately took out shame and I took out guilt from the equation. And now we can talk about emotions. The moment we have guilt and shame in the space, it stops being a safe space to talk about emotions. So that was the first level. Second level is I'm gonna challenge you guys to stop talking about emotions in the context of positive or negative emotions because that's so judgmental. Emotions are human reactions. There are emotions that feel good and emotions that do not feel good. Does it make them positive or negative? It just makes them emotions. And if this is a normal reaction to an abnormal situation, then why are we judging it? So instead of looking at emotions as positive versus negative, I wanna offer you the perspective of looking at them as balanced versus imbalanced. I'll tell you what I mean, okay? Let's look at happiness. Happiness is not a positive emotion. It's just an emotion, okay? It feels really good, okay? When happiness is balanced, I can shift to that meta view 
and ask myself, look at Shiri in the experience feeling happy and ask myself, what am I learning from this? When an emotion is imbalanced, I cannot separate myself from the emotion. I cannot see where the emotion begins and ends. I cannot move out of the situation to the meta view. The imbalanced version of happiness is euphoria. And euphoria is simply the sexy sister of denial, by the way. They're both dangerous. Just euphoria looks better, okay? But people in states of euphoria do pretty dangerous stuff and make very bad decisions. Let's talk about anger. Anger is not a negative emotion, it just feels bad, okay? But when anger is balanced, remember we can learn from every emotion. Anger is an amazing motivator. Look at history, the amazing things that people got did just because they were fed up and pissed off, okay? Anger teaches us about ethics, right and wrong. Anger teaches us about boundaries. But when anger becomes imbalanced, it becomes rage, then we are our anger and we feel like a forest fire. Nothing is, is separate from the anger. Let's talk about fear. Fear is not a negative emotion. It's just an emotion. It feels bad. Nobody likes to be scared. But guys, we need fear to survive. People that are not scared, you know, are in danger. But fear will teach us about connection. Fear will teach us about self-preservation. Fear many times teaches us about empathy. When fear is imbalanced, it becomes anxiety. Okay, then everything is the anxiety and I get lost in the anxiety. Confusion is just confusion. It's very uncomfortable, but confusion is gonna teach us about being with the, with, the, with the unknown. It teaches about vulnerability. It will teach us about flexibility. When it's imbalanced, it becomes disorientation. Okay, when we're confused, we can still access our values. Where we're disoriented, we lose our inner compass. Sadness, again, it's just sadness, okay? When I'm coaching a 33-year-old woman with two young children at home and she's in advanced stage of brain cancer, sadness is a normal reaction to an abnormal situation. If she, were, if she wouldn't be able to be sad, then she wouldn't be able to be coachable. She would need a psychiatrist, not a coach, okay? But the unbalanced version of sadness is not depression, by the way. I can say a few words about depression. I just want to keep an eye on the time here, okay? Um, Despair feels like a bottomless pit. When it comes to emotion, by the way, um, depression feels more like apathy than sadness. By the way, there's only one kind of depression, that's clinical depression. That profound sadness that we all feel, and by the way, that your clients are coming in more than ever right now, post COVID, is actually not depression, okay? Because depression is apathy. And depression, the clinical depression, is, an, is in a chemical imbalance in the brain. However, because we use the term depression so much, the new term for that is called reactive depression or depressive states, okay? Notice this is not apathy. This is people that are profoundly sad. If you add that to the burnout, to the fact that we have been living with high levels of stress for two years, it makes sense. But let us not call it depression. It's not, okay? It's not an imbalanced state of sadness. Now notice as we talk about things like that, then the conversation is about how do I shift from an imbalanced state to a balanced state? And from that we have the crash to coach state, exactly for this purpose. Here you have a few questions that I tend to use, you know, to kind of tickle the client's curiosity and look at, you know, the learning. It's not always easy to shift into a place of learning. What are we learning from this? especially if the emotion is not a feel-good emotion. But here are a few questions that you can use. Because those learnings are, are, are going to, uh, those learnings are going to help us shift into a place of action, creating new strategies, creating systems, emotional systems, behavioral systems. Okay, one more thing before we wrap up, another passion of mine, okay? I'm looking at the arm, I'm gonna do this quickly, I promise. Let's talk about VUCA, okay? We've been living in a VUCA state, by the way. 
Okay, so if you, you don't know what VUCA is, VUCA is an acronym, it stands for situations or conditions that are volatile, uncertain, complex, and ambiguous. This term was coined by the US Army, okay, to define situations where uh, soldiers went into combat and had to function well and achieve goals in a situation that was volatile, meaning the dynamics changed very quickly, it was uncertain, it was difficult to predict what's coming next and you didn't have all the information. It was complex, meaning there, were, there, was, there was a multiplex of forces and variables and things were changing like a system with a lot of parts that's constantly moving, okay? And it was ambiguous, meaning it was very difficult to identify cause and effect, okay? Get meaning, I identify the intention of different parts. This is VUCA. Now, we are living in a VUCA world and VUCA has a dark side, okay? Because there are two types of VUCA. There's visiting VUCA, okay? Which is called acute stress. And then there's living in a VUCA world, which is chronic stress. So when we talk about acute stress, we're talking about a short-term exposure to a specific stressor. A, stress, a stressor is a stress trigger, okay? And we're talking about chronic stress. We're talking about ongoing exposure to more than one more or what more than one or more unresolved stressor so acute stress has a beginning middle end chronic stress has a beginning middle 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 and good luck okay now if we don't deal with acute stress many times it can shift into a chronic stress and this is exactly what happened to us in the past two years we were prepared for acute stress we didn't take into consideration this is going to take two years and in some areas it's still going on Okay, but if we go back to VUCA, it's really important to understand that our neurology is wired to deal with acute stress. Okay, we can actually reach peak performance in acute stress situations. Okay, our neurology and system is not wired to deal with chronic stress. When we have high levels of cortisol in the blood, okay, for more than four to six weeks, it becomes a toxin. Okay, and it, and, it, and it wreaks havoc on our physiology, on our hormonal system, on our neurology and our behaviors. So acute stress is like visiting VUCA. We know how to do that. But when we start living in the VUCA world, this is the highway to depletion and, and burnout. There is this, um, this um, image, Okay, again, you're gonna get it in the slides, but it really shows you, okay, how stress a long time affects the performance. There's healthy pressure. At some point we reach optimal performance. Okay, and if we don't deal with the stress and it continues, we're gonna shift into hyperreactive stage all the way to damage and breakdown. Okay, this is where a visit to VUCA land turns into moving in. So, how do we flip it? There's a way to flip it. To deal with the volatility, we go back to vote to values, okay? Because values are the lighthouse. They are the DNA of who we are. When things are volatile, we go back to basics. What are my values? The moment my values are clear to me, okay? It can be stormy on the outside. It's clear on the inside, okay? When we're dealing with uncertainty, we want to start understanding what the stressors are. What exactly is causing the uncertainty? And then clear them. Some of them I can clear, some of them, you know, I will feel better just by knowing that this is a stressor. When we're dealing with complexity, we want to work on clear communication. First of all, communication to myself. What am I feeling? Going back to emotional agility, by the way. What am I feeling right now? What do I need? Where am I struggling? When it's clear to me what I'm feeling, where I'm struggling and what I need right now, then I communicate and communicate it out, okay? Part of communication is boundaries. And when we're dealing with ambiguity, we're dealing with agility, okay? So on this happy note, uh, since I don't have anywhere to go, but you know, to deal with a huge pile of laundry and I see their questions, I'm gonna be able to stay on for a little bit if you have time, um, but, I have a virtual goodie bag prepared for you guys with the slides, with a free digital course, with articles and stuff like that. All you have to do is email my assistant. Her name is Hani. Okay, so let me just 
okay? And she's waiting for your emails. She's asleep right now because it's half past 10 p.m. So it's going to take a few hours. She's going to get there tomorrow morning as well time. Okay. But just say, hi, honey. Okay. Please send me my goodie bag. I'm from ICF. Just had a webinar with Shiri. Something like that. Or just say, hey, honey, please send me my goodie bag. Okay. She'll know what it's all about. She's going to send you the goodie bag. One promise. I do nothing with your email addresses. If you do not actively opt into my mailing list, you will never hear from me again. Okay, so I, we do not, we're not allowed to keep, uh, according to the GDPR, we're not allowed to keep our email addresses and we do not do that. So on this happy note, questions, thoughts, requests. <laughs> so Sherry, actually there were just a couple questions in the yes. chat room. One yes, was um, from Nanor about asking when we were doing that diaphragmic breathing, um, breathing through the nose, but she she had asked, how do we breathe out through the nose or mouth? Yes, if you can breathe out through the nose, that's best. Okay. Um, you know, if you, other... oh. sorry. Oh no, go ahead, go ahead. No, it's just if if you can breathe in and out through the nose, that's best. If it's difficult, then inhale through the nose, exhale through the mouth. Okay, and if that's difficult, then inhale and exhale through the mouth. I mean, we need to breathe. Okay, <laughs> but. Uh... <laughs> And you then want, um, you want Naomi to to asked, the nose. And then Naomi just asked again the embodiment coach from Canada. What was his name? Uh, Dylan Newcomb. So what you want to do is is um, Google Uzazu. Okay. Okay. Um, amazing. It's all about tapping into the body intelligence. Amazing coaching modality. Okay. You're welcome, Carrie. You're welcome. Oh, thank you, guys. Uh, I have a question. Yes. Um, I had was in another uh, webinar several, probably a couple of years ago, and they were talking about the fact that the reason we can't necessarily name our emotions is because the two parts of the brain don't talk very well to each other. Your comment on that? I disagree. Okay. Okay. And I think that, you know, when, when you allow people to own their own emotions and their own subjective experience, and they say, use any language that you want to create that emotional vocabulary, then, then it's resolved. I, you know, I had a client that had an emotion called giggle juice. She knew what that meant. <laughs> yeah. You know, that's great. Thank you. You're welcome. Okay, Daryl, guys, so, no yeah, so we're, we're, yes. And Daryl, no other questions, right, in chat? Okay. Go ahead, Shiri, what were uh, you saying? So what I wanted to say was, um, in the in the goodie bag, you also, Khan is going to also send you ways to contact me. So if later on you have a question, if you want to pick my brain, if I'm available, I answer emails, seriously. So I'm available to you guys. Um, use my experience and knowledge. Awesome. Thank you. Thank you. So much. Thank you so yes, much. Daryl, do you want to say anything to Sheree or good? Just thank you. Um, this was great. I mean, it was very timely as I put in the chat room just a moment ago. It's a timely thing because, you know, of course, we've always been dealing with these. But as you mentioned, the last two years, especially, it just heightened all of this conversation and, and everything. And knowing how this impacts us as coaches so that we can do the best to serve our clients. So thank you. Thank you so much, my friend. My pleasure. Yeah, this was wonderful, Sheree. Thank you so much. Um, I definitely need to re-listen to it and practice some of the stuff myself, um, experiencing some of the uh, things, the emotional turbulence that you're talking about post-COVID right now. So <laughs> thank you. Um, pleasure. Yeah. Uh, Thank you everyone for joining us for your time and uh, and being, you know, learning more so that we can be better coaches and we can support our clients as well. So up leveling your coaching. Thank you for that. And you will be receiving one and a half CCEUs uh, for this. Give me give us about a week or two. And please join us for our next upcoming event. I believe it's on October. Oh gosh, now I can't remember. 
um, October 20th at 4.30 p.m. It's called Introducing Self-Actualization Coaching with Scott Barry Kaufman. And we have another event in October as well. So I put in the link. And um, yeah, so thanks for joining ICF Orange County, everyone. Have a great afternoon. Have a good evening, Cherie. Sleep tight. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Thank you, Cherie. That was wonderful. Thank you. I'm so happy. Thank you, guys. Bye-bye. <laughs> Thanks for putting this together for us, Daryl. <laughs> yeah. Yes, you're Maybe. welcome. Awesome. All right, guys. Um, let me see. I think Ira was in here twice. So I'm just going to remove yeah, it. Can probably stop the recording. Oh, I'd like to do that if I can find. There we go.